It's time for Spiritual Awakening Radio. My name is James Bean of SpiritualAwakeningRadio.com. Each week this program streams live and soon becomes a podcast available on demand. This is program number 539 in an ongoing effort, an ongoing lifestyle of research and recording radio programs. This week my focus is Mary Magdalene, the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and Gnostic spirituality. Each week Spiritual Awakening explores the world of spirituality, comparative religion, sacred texts, the path of the masters, the way of the saints and mystics, meditation practice, the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens. And this week, Mary Magdalene and Gnostic spirituality. I'm looking at two photographs right now. Photographs of mosaics on the floors of two different Hebrew Christian sanctuaries that were discovered in Israel. These are not even open to the public. One of them is a mosaic, a kind of floor icon found at a 6th century monastery called Lady Mary, Monastery of Lady Mary in Bet Shehan, Israel. It's a mosaic on the floor of this monastic sanctuary that portrays Jesus and Mary Magdalene as a divine couple. A sun god next to a moon goddess surrounded by the twelve signs of the zodiac. Although the signs of the zodiac here are not images of uh, Capricorn, Cancer, and so on, but rather twelve guys, twelve icons, standing for the twelve apostles. So the sun god the moon goddess, surrounded by the twelve signs of the zodiac, which really are twelve apostles. And in this monastic context, the sun god becomes the son of God, or Jesus, and the moon goddess is transformed into Mary Magdalene. The early Jesus movement seems to have reinterpreted these common images once used around the Mediterranean world for the sun god and the moon goddess, transforming them into the son of God and his companion, Mary of Magdala. It's fascinating to see. It's definitely a, a picture that's worth more than a thousand words of uh, the, the Da Vinci Code or Gospel of Mary. It's really a, quite an image to see. If you'd like to see this image that I'm looking at here, Send me a text message or an email and I'll send you a link. I've got this up online. My uh, text message number is 508-603-9381. 508-603-9381 or send me an email at this address, james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. Ask for the icon image of Jesus and Mary. Now, this is described as coming from a sanctuary and monastery used by a Hebrew Christian sect. What this means is, this is a group in antiquity that maintained, as, as a Christian group, its Jewish roots. So, Saturday is the Sabbath. The diet was vegetarian. They observed the new moons, the feast days of the Jewish calendar, day of Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. They maintained their Jewish roots. were not so much oriented toward the teachings of the Apostle Paul, but were more allied with the teachings of James the Just, a spiritual successor of Christ in this original Jewish Christian group.
founded in Jerusalem and relocated, of course, after 70 AD elsewhere, but continued on for a few centuries. The Hebrew Christians were much closer to the world of the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Gospel of the Hebrews, Gospel of the Ebionites. This group is also referred to as the Nazareans. Sometimes they're called the Ebionites as well. So they took pagan elements and converted them into Christian symbols and then eventually got around to creating their own icons and their own uh, symbols. Uh, and it's really fascinating to see. It's fascinating to see this imagery. Several places in the Gospel of Philip, a Nag Hammadi library book found in Upper Egypt, Mary Magdalene is described as the companion of Christ, saying that Yeshua, or Jesus, loved Mary, was closer to Mary than the other disciples. And the Gospel of Philip also records that Yeshua used to often kiss Mary on her mouth. Actually, that last part, often kiss Mary on the mouth, unquote, is a restoration of the text with the word mouth added. It is likely what is said, according to Coptic scholars, uh, but on this page of the Gospel of Philip in the original Coptic papyrus, it reads, used to kiss her often on her, and then there is a lacuna or break in the text with that last word missing. Because it was eaten by ants sometime between the 4th century and 1945 when it was rediscovered. A few ants uh, were eating away at the Nag Hammadi Coptic Gospels that were found in Egypt and uh, and the damage of time, weather and ants and just pulling them out of the ground and all of the wear and tear of the centuries caused uh, some breaks in the text, including the word mouth or whatever was supposed to be there. Used to kiss her often on her eaten by ants, a break in the text but scholars believe it was uh, lips. Uh, and I think that's probably a likely to be accurate restoration of the text because the text says, why do you love her more than us? And Mary Magdalene is described as the companion of Yeshua. So I think that's a, a likely rendering. It, it could have been kneecap, I suppose. <laughs> kiss her often on the forehead, cheek, kneecap. But it seems very reasonable and likely, given the statement by the other disciples that seem to be kind of voicing uh, jealousy or recording a, a degree of intimacy between Jesus and Mary Magdalene that was not going on between Jesus and them. And thus we move from cheek, I think, to lips, most likely. Uh, in that case, as Coptic scholars have have determined. Jesus would often kiss Mary on the mm, probably mouth, I would say. And that's from the Gospel of Philip, one of the Nag Hammadi books found in Egypt, one of the missing Gospels that were restored after they were discovered in 1945 sealed up in a clay storage jar like a time capsule for almost 2,000 years. In several texts of antiquity, the orthodox figure by the name of Peter, the Apostle Peter, is portrayed as the opponent and critic of Mary Magdalene. Kind of almost on behalf of institutional Christianity as it was evolving at the time and as it has since over the centuries, uh, he voices opposition to the idea that women can be leaders in early Christianity equal to males. Peter hassles Mary Magdalene across the pages of several ancient texts, including the Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the Questions of Mary, and Pistis Sophia. Mary even says in one place, Peter hates our gender, and I'm afraid of him. And, uh, but basically, in, 
Peace to Sophia, the Gnostic Gospel of Faith Wisdom, uh, Jesus states something to the effect that uh, your point of view will win out. You know, you have the truth on your side, Mary Magdalene, and you have the accurate interpretation of the teachings, and your point of view will prevail. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Thomas, the final saying we have in the Coptic edition, some people believe it was actually added later. In any case, it's very close to the Mary Magdalene tradition. It's almost like a like the end of Thomas is the beginning of the Gospel of Mary. They're that intertwined, which makes a lot of sense. I'll address that point shortly. Saying 114 in the Gospel of Thomas, another Coptic Gnostic text found at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. Simon Peter said to him, Let Mary leave us, for women are not worthy of life. Here, I think he was referring to spiritual life. Uh, Jesus said, I myself shall lead her in order to make her male, so that she too may become a living spirit, resembling you males. For every woman who will make herself male will enter the kingdom. And this is using language, you know, uh, feminine referring to earthly, temporal, women give birth, people who are born by definition also die. And so female is equated in this language of this particular group as referring to the material plane, whereas uh, male is more in line with father sky or spiritual. And also, I think, also pertains to celibacy. So if uh, instead of women uh, bearing children and being part of families will be like these other monkish or sadhu-like disciples, then she too can be part of the inner circle. I think that's how I would interpret these words of uh, saying 114, that Mary can lead a, a contemplative kind of monastic life like the, the male disciples, and therefore, you know, be equally as spiritual. And in any case, Jesus is advocating for Mary to be part of the inner circle of the disciples whereas Peter is voicing, as he so often does, uh, resistance to the idea of women in general, and Mary in particular, being part of that inner circle. So, some sexist language represented by Peter, which some view as a kind of code word for orthodoxy, whereas uh, Jesus in, is advocating to include Mary Magdalene, and Mary Magdalene here, I, I believe, is kind of code for uh, Gnostic or contemplative Christianity or Gnosticism. In the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, other apostles like Levi uh, said to Peter that he's always being the hothead. He's the hothead of the group. And he says to leave Mary alone and instead uh, respect the more tolerant and inclusive views of Jesus regarding Mary. And as I read the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, it, it's like reading the Gospel uh, who, uh, of the, the wife of the guru. The master has passed on, and the wife or companion of the master has the clearest understanding of his teachings. And that seems to be where she's coming from, you know, in the Gospel of Mary. I, I think of Mary as the wife of the guru. And, of course, the, the Gospel of Mary dates back many centuries, long before Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown, and or, or, or The Last Temptation of Christ, Martin Scorsese, and, and various movies that have attempted to try and fill in the lacuna or the blanks of history. Uh, coming to similar conclusions, even based on the regular Gospels of the Orthodox New Testament, which also have Mary Magdalene, a, a, a rather central figure, 
and the first to see Jesus after his resurrection, the first visionary appearance of the resurrected Christ, is to Mary Magdalene, and that all fits in too. Both the Orthodox and not-so-Orthodox Gospels all kind of tell various parts of the same story from different vantage points, if you will. In the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, at one point during a vision, a soul says, The soul answered, saying, You did not see me, nor did you know me. You mistook the garment I wore for my true self, and you did not recognize me. How easy it is to only see the surface, to in fact be wasting away whole lifetimes being a surface dweller, neither knowing one's self or seeing the true identity of others as souls. In truth, we are all particles of light dwelling within bodies. We are notes that make up a divine symphony. As George Arnsby Jones once said in his great unknown spiritual classic, The Pilgrimage of James and Odyssey of Inner Space, all beautiful forms and tones of this world are mere reflections of some aspect of that ultimate love music of the great creative word. Within the vast complex of creation, each individual spirit is himself, herself, a spark of that eternal soul of love. The Gnostics, like other mystics of the ages, see the soul as being beyond gender. The physical and subtle bodies, astral, causal, mental, etheric, have a gender or combination of genders. But the soul is beyond gender. Therefore, the Gnostics of 2,000 years ago, and mystics generally, were more open to the idea of the leadership roles of women, including an apostle, as in the case of Mary Magdalene, who is portrayed in the Gospel of Mary as a kind of spiritual successor of Yeshua, or wife of the Master, perhaps, wife of the Guru, and more enlightened than anyone else in the group with a clearer understanding and inside track of knowledge about the true teachings, the complete teachings of Jesus, which makes sense if that was indeed the case. There is also some closeness between the sayings of Jesus found in the Gospel of Mary and those in the Gospel of Thomas. Perhaps the same group in antiquity used both. Interesting souls, no doubt. There is some kind of connection, I think, between the Gospel of Thomas community and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene community. There are parallel sayings, similar versions of sayings found in Thomas, also found in the Gospel of Mary, and other books that both uh, sects used at one time, like, for instance, Dialogue of the Savior is another one. And so it's, it's like the same group, basically, using several texts in common, which makes sense, Gospel of Thomas being very prominent amongst uh, all of them. And so we find that this idea of Mary Magdalene being the wife of the guru, wife of Jesus, is not a new idea invented by Martin Scorsese or Dan Brown of the Da Vinci Code fame or some 1970s movement for equality. But rather, this goes back thousands of years so to the early days of Christianity. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, uh, it is said by most scholars, dates back to the 2nd century AD, when most all of these Gospels uh, date back to. And I know there are many that always like to date Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John practically to the, the time of the crucifixion. But, you know... There's a saying in Luke, the beginning verses of the Gospel of Luke, where Luke says, Many have undertaken to write accounts or gospels of these things. You know, I've all, that, that verse from the beginning of Luke has always stuck with me because, Hey Luke, 
who are all these many gospel people, gospel writers that have had the time to write their gospels and then Luke comes along after them to make his contribution and to creating the gospel of Luke. Does that all get done by 50 AD or 70 AD or even 90 AD, I wonder? I wonder. A lot of these texts seem to come from the second century, including some texts that some people feel strongly about uh, that must, in their view, must have come from the first century. But I do wonder, especially when I read that opening verse of Luke, which talks about several other Gospels already have, having been written by then. After the break, we shall explore the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. Stay tuned for more after these messages. Spiritual Awakening Radio streams live. Tuesdays on HealthyLife.net, Positive Talk Radio. It first streams live for the first time on Tuesdays and is repeated at other times, Sunday morning, and other times there are encore broadcasts heard by way of HealthyLife.net, Positive Talk Radio. And then very soon the program becomes available online on demand for free as a podcast. My contact information, if you'd like to receive links for free to the Gospel of Mary Magdalene online. A link to the photo of the mosaic of Jesus and Mary surrounded by icons of the Twelve Apostles that I described earlier. I have links to all of these writings that are online that you can read for free, the Nag Hammadi or Gnostic Gospels, including the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Just send me a, an email or a text message and I'll send you a link to the information that I'm sharing on today's program dedicated to the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and Gnostic spirituality. My email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com or send a text message to 508-603-9381. 508 603 9381. Visit my website, spiritualawakeningradio.com. There you'll find a donate button that helps keep this program alive and well for another week, another month, another year. And there are links to daily spiritual quotes by way of social media, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, and other sites. You'll find links at my website to social media blogs, various articles, links to podcasts as well. The address is spiritualawakeningradio.com. This is a very Buddhist sounding saying from the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The phrase, the Blessed One, often turns up in Buddhist sutras. What's it doing in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene? When the Blessed One had said this, he greeted them all, saying, Peace be with you. Acquire my peace within yourselves. Be on your guard so that no one deceives you by saying, Look over here or look over there. For the seed of true humanity exists within you. The Son of Man is within you. Follow after it. Those who search for it will find it. The term Blessed One is found not only in the Gospel of Mary, but in Pista Sophia as well. Were there a few Buddhists in the Western world during the early centuries AD? The answer is yes. Especially in the city of Alexandria in Egypt. A few Buddhists, not many, but a few and a few Buddhist sutras as well. So there does seem to be evidence for a slight, very slight, subtle Buddhist influence. 
in a few of these texts. The Blessed One is an interesting description found in the Gospel of Mary and in Peace to Sophia, which also uses the term or the phrase the compassionate one as well on a few occasions. Not many, but a few. Enough to get my attention. Enough for me to notice. The Gnostic Gospel of Mary Magdalene. It's in a genre of literature known as apocryphal writings, extra-canonical scriptures, Gnostic Gospels, lost books of the Bible, Dead Sea Scrolls. In some cases, these are books once viewed as scripture by some around the Roman Empire in Christianity or Judaism, but were later dropped, later disappeared from sight, such as the Book of First Enoch, Letters of First and Second Clement, Letter of Barnabas, Shepherd of Hermas, Apocalypse of Peter, the Didache, Odes of Solomon, and others. To this day, the Ethiopian Bible contains a total of 81 books, more than any other present-day conventional Bible used by a Christian sect. And there were dozens and scores of additional writings never known to or embraced by European Christianity, but nevertheless read as scripture by various indigenous spiritual communities located in North Africa, the Middle and Near East, all the way to China. These are writings composed long ago by Jewish and Christian authors and were used as scripture by lesser-known religious sects of antiquity, some of which were discriminated against by larger sects of antiquity, such as the Essenes, the Ebionite Christians, the St. Thomas Church of the East, the Valentinians, the Sethians, Manichaeans, the Nestorians, or other expressions of early Christianity based in Israel, Syria, around Mesopotamia, Turkey, Egypt, Greece, Armenia, Iran, along the Silk Road, India, China, especially Eastern China, and even a few in Japan. A few uh, uh, people even made it to Japan, apparently. Indeed, many other collections of the sayings of Jesus, fascinating gospel accounts, letters, revelations or apocalypses, psalms, and spiritual discourses have been preserved. One can easily purchase translations of them or read them for free online. Think of all these documents, both the more familiar New Testament and the other apocryphal scriptures, as being like pieces of a puzzle. If we combine these pieces together, a larger, more colorful, diverse, amazing, and spiritually satisfying picture starts to emerge. Rather than being ignored, the rich spiritual heritage of Christianity in all of these cultures should be celebrated. There is a vast amount of spiritual wisdom and inspiration in many of these sacred texts, including the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. After the break, we will continue our journey into this world of apocryphal scriptures, especially the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and uncover the evidence found in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene for this other form of Christianity. What did it teach? How is it different from the Christianity we know today? And is there a more spiritual practice to be found in the Gospel of Mary? Stay tuned and find out. The name of the program is Spiritual Awakening.
Spiritual Awakening Radio explores the world of spirituality, comparative religion, and books of the East and the West. As I mentioned earlier, the opening verses of the New Testament Gospel of Luke begin by saying something I find rather intriguing. Luke says many have undertaken to write Gospels prior to his contribution of the Gospel of Luke. Others have undertaken to write accounts of these things, and then Luke throws his hat in the ring as well and composes the Gospel of Luke. And I just find that to be very intriguing. Who are these other gospel writers he is referring to? What are these other gospels written prior to the time of the Gospel of Luke? Who could they be? When you say many, I don't really think of many as referring to Matthew, Mark, and John. When I think of many, I think of at least several. More than one or two, for sure. I find that very intriguing. Most of the actual physical evidence for ancient Gospels begins in the second century with various manuscripts of Gospel material found in parchments written in the Greek language as well as in the Coptic language, which is very similar to Greek, but used by Coptic Christians in Egypt during the early centuries AD and to this very day. Coptic is still a language used by the Coptic Christians of Egypt. The evidence for both canonical and extra-canonical Gospels really blossoms in the second century. Most of these texts date back to the second century AD, including the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. There is a wonderful book which has a lot of the surviving Gospel material gathered up in a single convenient volume. It's called The Complete Gospels, edited by Robert J. Miller and published by Pullbridge Press. Easy to find. I'm sure it's at Amazon. I think it's still in print. Easy to get through interlibrary loan or as an ebook or download or, you know, easy to get. The Complete Gospels, edited by Robert J. Miller. It has in it Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Greek Thomas, Coptic Thomas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, James the Just, the Edgerton Gospel, various Oxyrhynchus fragments of Gospels. Lots of interesting things can be found in that book. A very valuable, indispensable book to have if you're interested in the subject of Gnostic Gospels and other Gospels of early Christianity. It also has one of the best translations of the Gospel of Mary because it is a damaged text, ravaged by discrimination and time. You know, all have all, time and, and discrimination and just bad attitudes around the Roman Empire about publishing of texts have taken their toll on the Gospel of Mary for many centuries. It's a miracle that we have it at all even some of it. There are missing chapters and missing sections of the Gospel of Mary, but a few different editions have been discovered, each quite badly tattered. And what scholars have done in the edition, especially the edition found in the complete Gospels, is combine together the various uh, bits and pieces into one text to make it as whole as possible, like pieces of a puzzle. Or if you have like three copies of the same puzzle, but each puzzle has pieces that are missing, but each puzzle doesn't have the same pieces missing, and you can use by combining all three together to fill in more of the missing pieces, and you start to get a more complete puzzle. That's what they've done. 
with the translation of the Gospel of Mary found in the complete Gospels. It's a very good one to get if you're interested in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The Complete Gospels by Robert J. Miller is a great text. Scholars analyzing the internal clues provided by the text itself generally have the view that the Gospel of Mary Magdalene uh, was composed sometime during the late 1st or early 2nd centuries AD, perhaps in Syria, which is sort of home base or HQ for Christians and Essenes during that period after the fall of Jerusalem. It was the home of many fascinating Jewish and Christian communities in antiquity. Syria is kind of the capital of uh, all of these folks all of these uh, various uh, Jewish, Christian, Gnostic, Ebionite forms of Christianity. Uh, Syria was their headquarters. A large number of Gnostic or mystical scriptures were composed in Greek in Syria and eventually made their way from Syria to Egypt where monks copied them into the Coptic language, the language of Egyptian Christianity. And that's where we find various uh, surviving manuscripts of the Gospel of Mary. Books composed in Syria, but made their way to Egypt, where the climate is dry and ancient texts survive, usually hidden in the walls of monasteries or behind a staircase, or stuffed in a clay jar nearby a Coptic monastery here and there, scattered throughout Egypt. We don't have much information about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene community, the spiritual group that once used it as scripture, other than what can be observed in the contents of the book. It presents Mary as not only equal to her male counterparts as an apostolic leader in early Christianity, but also perhaps as the widow of Christ, the wife of the guru and his primary spiritual successor with the most complete understanding of Christ's message and teachings. Mary also described visions of the radiant form of her master, the resurrected Christ. She was a, a mystic, a visionary given to times of contemplative meditation and solitude. Some of the teachings presented within the Gospel of Mary Magdalene have a familiar Eastern ring to them, very at home in the esoteric tradition. After the break, I want to delve into the esoteric teachings present in the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. At the end of today's edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio, dedicated to Mary Magdalene and Gnostic spirituality, listen for my text message number and email address. If you'd like to receive a free copy of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and a link to the image that I described earlier of Jesus, Mary, surrounded by the Twelve Apostles. Just wait for that and I'll give you my email address and text message number at the end of this segment today. What's the takeaway of this research about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, this research into this and other ancient texts? One, Mary Magdalene is portrayed as the companion of Christ. Two, Mary Magdalene is characterized as the spiritual leader of the group, like one would expect if she really were the wife of the guru who naturally would have the most insight into his teachings. Also, the leadership role of women is a very real thing, as described by the Gospel of Mary, but not only in the Gospel of Mary. For instance, there are letters of the Apostle Paul that mention female leaders or apostles in the churches he was affiliated with. And, of course, I've seen um, uh, icon images of Paul standing next to Thecla, a female apostle. There is a book called The Acts of Paul and Thecla 
dedicated to the teachings of Thecla, the teachings and activities and miracle stories about Thecla, the female apostle in early Christianity. So there is a historic record that seems to uh, suggest the very real leadership role of women in early Christianity, not just Gnostic Christianity, but even in Orthodox Christianity as well. Uh, three, there is a closeness of the Gospel of Thomas to the Gospel of Mary, and like Thomas was uh, composed in Greek, the Gospel of Mary was originally composed in Greek sometime in the early 2nd century, probably in a city like Edessa, Syria, and eventually copies were made by Egyptian monks into the Coptic language of Egypt, and some of those copies that date back to the 3rd century are what have been found in Egypt in various discoveries. And four, Mary Magdalene was a visionary or a mystical soul who had visions of the resurrected Christ, seeing the radiant form of her master. And she described visions of several different heavenly realms. Now, uh, the idea of seeing one's spiritual master after the death of that master is a thing in the mystical tradition. In the Sant tradition of India, for instance, people still see the radiant form, or have visionary experiences in meditation of their master. Uh, even today, even right now, uh, people see visions of Sant Kirpal Singh, for instance, or Hazura Baba Sawan Singh, or some other recently passed on uh, spiritual master of the Sant tradition, Swami Sant Seviji, Maharaj, Maharishi Mehi, Paramhans, etc. So this is a thing in the Sant tradition to this day, and uh, I believe it was Teresa of Avila, Spain, who described a, a vision of her abbot or spiritual mentor after he had passed on. So your teacher, the one that you feel closest to, who initiated you into the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, uh, they may still be in your life even now and may appear to you in visionary form or what some people interpret as a resurrected form. That is a very real thing. One of the greatest uh, takeaways, I would say, from my research into the Gospel of Mary is the description by Mary Magdalene of the heavens, the higher planes. One of the most interesting things about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene is the cosmology, a description of several different heavenly realms and the ascension of the soul through these heavenly realms as being the goal of their spiritual practice to ascend, to pass through heaven one, heaven two, heaven three, heaven number four, heaven number five, six, and seven, and then back to God again beyond the heavens. In Gnostic scriptures, such as the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, unenlightened human existence is portrayed as a kind of night of the living dead, souls living in a world of sleep, caught up in dreams of illusion, trapped in spiritual ignorance somewhere in time, limited only to a couple of dimensions, tethered to material existence, seemingly unable to become aware of anything more. One of my favorite passages from the Gospel of Mary is when one liberated soul exclaims, I was set loose from a world and from a chain of forgetfulness that exists in time. You know, kind of like, thank God that's over with now. You know, and I am free. I am free. Another Mary, further to the east by the name of Mirabai, once said, my mind, birth after birth, lost in slumber, awoke on hearing the sound my master gave. One of the most intriguing things about the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, I find, to be the cosmology 
of several different heavens, her visions, the concept that human beings can be devoted to silence and meditation, have radiant form visitations, have visions of their spiritual master, and to ascend spiritually within oneself through different heavenly realms and go back to God again. And this process of ascension isn't just about after death, but is about right now. This process of ascension begins during one's time of spiritual practice, during one's time of daily meditation. That's when the soul has this opportunity to ascend and one has the opportunity to see and hear, to explore the kingdom of the heavens. To receive links to the Gospel of Mary, the image, uh, the mosaic of Jesus, Mary, and the Twelve Apostles that I described earlier, send me a text message at this number, 508-603-9381. 508-603-9381 or send me an email at this address james at spiritualawakeningradio.com Thanks for listening.